How is everyone doing? Did you have a good lunch? Hey, well, I, I hope so. Uh, I heard that Bel Canto was a blessing, so praise the Lord for that. You guys went all the way down the road to Hamburg, and we're so thankful that uh, Elder Jay is here with us. He's not charging us his lawyer rate to be with us here this week, which is really nice. Uh, and uh, we, I know I've been blessed. I know Jesus was lifted up, and uh, I think we were all drawn unto him this last uh, service earlier this day. And so I know we're talking about singing a song. I think our our praise team is going to have a closing song. It's going to be 152 at the end of the service. So they're just arranging a few things for that. But we have a few leftover questions from this morning. And so um, I'm probably going to ask some questions from the front row. And uh, we'll ask Jay to come up. But before we do, uh, let's say a prayer. Father in heaven, thank you that we can be here to discuss the cross, to discuss, discuss our redemption to discuss the love you have for us, but we're also going to be talking a little bit about religious liberty, liberty of conscience threatened, as we've been told in the book Great Controversy, some current event um, situations that are happening, and how we can be ready. You know, these things are coming to pass that we might believe, not to be afraid, but Lord, we just pray that as you um, lead our discussion here with these last four or five questions, that your wisdom would be given unto Jay, and that Lord you'd be lifted up. We love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Yep. All right. So we had a handful. And there's an evangelism question that we'll save until the end for the 40 people that are joining us at 6 o'clock. Um, you might want to dress warm and this will maybe be the last question of the evangelism question six. Okay, here's one question. As a Christian lawyer, how do you defend someone you know is guilty? So the only way that the law works properly is if in a criminal situation, if you have a vigorous prosecution and a vigorous defense. And even if somebody might be guilty of something, there are laws in place to prevent government oppression. For example, there are laws against unreasonable search and seizure, uh, you know, and you cannot just have the police barging into your house, rooting through your stuff. So there are laws to keep government in line. If those laws are broken, the Constitution steps in to stop the proceeding, even though somebody might be technically uh, 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 guilty. You want those laws to exist because they protect citizens from government overreach. It's places where there are no constitutional limits on state power, where you have terrible oppression. And so the Constitution is there to protect people. And so as a, as a lawyer, if you're defending somebody, uh, you want the state to have to go through the process that it has to, to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that somebody is guilty. If somebody is not proven to be guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, they should be released. Because that standard protects all of society. And so even if you have a suspicion that somebody is guilty, they did something bad, if the state cannot prove that they did something bad, that person should not be convicted. Because that, that is a rule that safeguards all people in society. Do you, all, do you understand what I'm saying? Uh, and it's very important that these rules be uh, um, observed and that the courts uphold them. Because the state has all of these resources and you as an individual have very small resources so you have this gargantuan institution that has all of this power. If there are not restrictions on its power, you pay the price. The person who helps to make sure that the lawyer, uh, the, the person, that the state jumps through the hoops, the person who makes sure that that happens is the lawyer and then the judge. So that's the way the system is set up. And um, you know, like I said before, all of us are guilty. And yet Jesus died for us through faith in his blood and in his merits, we have faith in the atonement and God can be just in punishing Christ for the sins of humanity and the justifier of those who believe in Jesus. Jesus is our only propitiation. He's our only way uh, because all of us are guilty. Okay, next question. This person asks, should Adventists be involved in politics when, 
whether it be local, state, or national. Okay, so I, um, when I was young, now I don't believe that you should be involved in partisan politics. I have no partisan loyalties uh, myself. Um, you know, your adherence to a team, this is my team, team red or team blue, you know, uh, it's the same thing with another question that I think we're gonna touch on, and that's to do with unions. Um, you know, if you have a party affiliation, you back your party, what happens when your party does something bad? What happens when your party has a representative and they do something bad? All of a sudden, what? You, are you supposed to say, yeah, that's fine? Because aren't, don't you have higher loyalties to the government of God and to what right and wrong is? So that's a very slippery slope. People get into affiliation. But I want to read you this quote. Dear youth, what is the aim and purpose of your life? Are you ambitious for education that you may have a name and position in the world? Some of you here might have ambitions to have a name and position in the world, to stand on the stage of government, or to stand in media, or to stand in, as a researcher or as a scientist. So this is from the Spirit of Prophecy. Have you thoughts that you dare not express, that you may one day stand upon the summit of intellectual greatness, that you may sit in deliberative and legislative councils and help to enact laws for the nation? There is nothing wrong with these aspirations. You may, every one of you, make your mark. You should be content with no mean attainments, aim high, and spare no pains to reach the standard. So she's saying, God has given you potential. He's given you talents. Utilize those talents. Study hard. Reach as high as you can. Ask God for leading. You know, when I was looking at writing the bar and going to law school, I asked God to lead and to stop the process if it wasn't his will. I'd go do something else. And, um, you know, I always counsel that you do that. But if you have no uh, high aspirations that you want to go and stand in the halls of the legislature, if you want to stand in the public square and stand in defense of liberty of conscience, then there's nothing wrong with that. So that's from the spirit of prophecy. Amen. Yes. I guess we'll segue right into that union question then as you touched on it. Okay. It says, what is the Adventist church's position on joining a labor union. All right, so we're told in the spirit of prophecy that labor unions will be one of the agencies that will bring upon this earth a time of trouble such as has not been since the world began. If you are aware of what is going on with the papacy and the push for climate change, one of the reasons for Sunday sacredness that is being stated over and over and over again is workers' rights. And the unions are behind that. There were two Democrat lawmakers within the last 10 days speaking to the media about Sunday ought to be observed as a sacred day of rest by the nation to protect workers' rights. There are laws, or there are cases in many Western nations, this nation, Canada, other nations, which say that if a Sunday law is enacted for a secular purpose, it is constitutional. It can't be enacted for a religious purpose, but if it's for a secular purpose, it's constitutional. This is what some of the case law says. And so, uh, one of the groups pushing for Sunday sacredness is unions. And if you're a member of the union and the union starts, uh, for example, okay, I'll give a very short synopsis. Jesus tells this story and there's a man and he's hiring workers. You know the story? And he goes out in the early morning and he says, if you come work for me in my field, I'll give you a silver penny. Right? I'll, give you, I'll give you a denarius or I'll give you a penny for the day's work, which was the standard wage. Then a little while later, Jesus goes, or the man goes back out. He symbolizes Jesus, but the, the business owner, the farmer goes back out, and he says, I need more workers. I'll give you a penny for, days, for, the, for labor for the rest of the day. So the people come. Then later in the afternoon, again, same thing. Then one hour remaining, he goes and he says, if you come work for me for one hour, I'll give you a penny. And when payment time comes, he pays the people who only work for an hour a penny. And the people who work during the daytime, for the whole day, they say, well, look at it. We're going to get way more money because if the guy only worked for an hour and he got a penny, we're going to get more money. And Jesus gives, or the, the man, the farmer, the business owner, gives them a penny as well. And they're upset. And you know what Jesus says? Why are you upset? Didn't we contract for a penny? So why are you upset? And the thing with unions is, is that they make a contract 
Those employees make a contract with a business for wages at a certain amount. And then they use the power of the union to overthrow that agreement. They go on strike. And they say, we, even though we said we were going to work, we're not going to work. And so that's dishonest. Work your contract, negotiate a new contract. Don't attempt to renegotiate and use leverage to get what you want. That's a, that's a form of stealing and theft. And so that's what unions are often involved in. And uh, so you ask if, if you should be involved in it. According to the spirit of prophecy, the trade unions and confederates of the world are a snare. Keep out of them and away from them, brethren. Have nothing to do with them because of these unions and confederacies. It will soon be very difficult for our institutions to carry on their work in the cities. So I think that's pretty clear. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, are there any jobs or careers that it is okay to work on Sabbath? Yeah, the Sabbath is made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And so the Sabbath is for rest. But there is, Jesus tells a story about how which of you don't go out and let your donkey loose to go have a drink of water? Do you let your donkey loose? Yes. You know, do you let your horse use or loose or your cow to go have a drink of water? So is that work, to go let your donkey loose so that they can drink? He's like, that's not breaking the Sabbath. And so the service where you're serving another person in the medical field, I'm not talking about like somebody's getting plastic surgery and it's an elective surgery. I'm talking about like if you are actually working and somebody needs your care, uh, those are things that the church has typically said that you can labor on Sabbath for because it's consistent with what Jesus said. So... Okay, and then this is the last one. Um, this person asks, how do I efficiently share Jesus with others, especially when it seems to be, be no way to bring the subject up in a conversation? And the people you want to share it with are always making jokes, and there's barely any opportunities to bring up a serious subject. Okay, so I think that this is a really good question. And just in my experience, I can only speak from my experience. The Lord will create opportunities for you to speak to people. You have partners in the work of evangelism. You have the Holy Spirit. You have the angels. And so don't think to yourself, well, I have to go make an opening. I've got to force the issue. You know, you're going to hear about Jesus today and cram him down their throat. That's not a recipe for success. But what you can do is pray for people. If you're worried about your parents... If you're worried about your sister, if you're worried about your brother, you're worried about your friend, pray for that person. Ask for the Lord to open up an opportunity to speak to them. And then when the opportunity opens up, ask the Lord to give you courage to step through it. Right? And, um, you know, uh, there's a lot of people, you know, you labor a long time for family members or your friends, and you think, you know, they're never going to come to Jesus. And, uh, you know, years down the road, all of a sudden, the door opens and uh, a word spoken in due season is the means of their salvation. How many of you have seen that happen? You know, where, where your mom or your dad or your sister, your brother, your friend comes to Jesus after years of you praying for them. So don't give up on people. Jesus never gives up on you. So, but that is my advice. If you want to minister to somebody, take time to pray for them. Take time to sit down and really pray for that person and ask the Lord to create an opportunity for you to talk to them. And then have the courage to walk through that door when it opens um, and ask the Lord to give you insight into when it happens. All right, that's it? Okay. All right, so I have a bit of a hodgepodge presentation tonight for you. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about li liberty of conscience. And um, before we do, let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for the time that we have. Lord, I pray that you'll bless this, this group of young people. Lord, you see the path that you would have them take. Lord, help them to commit their lives to you and surrender to you so that you can work in their life for the glory of your kingdom and for the saving of humanity. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so I'm going to start with a discussion. So there was a question last night about Christian overcoming. Uh, you know, at Afterglow. And so I just want to start with the story of Gideon, 
We're going to go through it really fast because uh, we need to be done by 5 p.m. here, and so we'll move right along. But uh, suffice to say, the book of Judges contains multiple stories where Israel had backslidden. They had gone back into worshiping idols. They had left God. They didn't want to talk to God anymore. They wanted to talk with their idols, and they didn't want to serve God. And so after a little while, God says, look, I can't reach you in any other way. And so I have to allow these other countries to come in and to oppress you so that you see that I have been protecting you. And so uh, Judges chapter 6, verse 1, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years. And the verse continues and says that the circumstances were so bad. The Midianites came in. They had a big, huge army. And the Midianites, they took all their fields. They took all their houses. They took all their property. And the Israelites were pushed out of their towns. And they're living up in the mountains in caves. And life was really lousy for Israel. And they weren't worshiping God during good times. And now they're living in caves up in the mountains. And life was really hard. And the Bible continues and it says that when Israel had sown, meaning when they planted their crops, the Midianites came up and the Amalekites and the children of the east, they came up and they destroyed everything. So they harvested the field and they were like grasshoppers and they ate all their food. And Israel, it says there in verse 6, you can see it on the screen, Israel was greatly impoverished. So Israel lost everything. And I just want to frankly tell you, that's what's going to happen to us. There will be an economic crisis. There will be an economic collapse. There will be a time of trouble. You know, the last big depression was in the 30s. The stock market crashed in October 1929, I think. It was 29. And then there was a, a decade of poverty and bread lines. And that is coming back. So you are going to live through that. And, uh, you know, this is what happened to ancient Israel as well. And people get very comfortable, and they don't want God, and they abandon God, and then he says, I'm going to let you have your own way. So Israel was greatly impoverished, and there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak. So the, listen to this. Uh, part of the story is very interesting. This angel comes and he is watching Gideon. It says that, uh, that the angel sat down under the oak, which was in Ophrah, that pertained unto Joash the Abizarite, and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the wine press. He was hiding it from the Midianites. So Gideon is trying to harvest enough food to feed his family, and he's hiding it by threshing it in the wine press or by the wine press. And the angel comes and sits down, and he's watching Gideon. Now, Gideon doesn't know that the angel is there. And the implication of the text is that the, the angel is there for a little while. And then the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. It's really interesting. So the word in Hebrew, yeshab, is to sit down specifically as a judge. And so the word there when it says that the angel sits down in the shadow of an oak. The angel of the covenant who is Christ himself, is evaluating Gideon. In, in other words, he is investigating Gideon. And Gideon doesn't know he's even under investigation. Did you know that now is the time of the investigative judgment? You know this, right? And that probation will soon close, yes? And it is the time of the harvest. Is now the time of the harvest also? It is also the time of harvest, and judgment takes place in the shadow of a great tree. So it's a very interesting story here, the way that it's set up. And Gideon answers and says, how can you say I'm a mighty man of valor? How can you say that the Lord is with us? We've lost everything. And the Lord said unto him, verse 16, surely I will be with you, and you shall smite the Midianites as one man. Now, Gideon receives instructions to go to war with the Midianites. But before Gideon can go to war with the Midianites, he's told something else. I know it's been a long day here. Uh, you know, it's been a long day, and uh, I'll try and make this as interesting as possible. Um, Gideon is given instructions. Before he is told to go and fight Midian, he is told to do something. What is that thing? Do you remember? 
It's right here. It, the, the Lord tells him, take your father's young bull, even the second bull of seven years, and throw down the altar of Baal that your father has and cut down the altar that, or the grove that is by it. Okay, so now let's just recap what's going on. Israel's life is very lousy. They're living up in the caves. The Midianites have stolen all their food. Life is lousy. It stinks. No matter how bad it is, though, in the backyard of Gideon's father's house is what? What's there? There's an idol to Baal in his father's backyard. So even though they're suffering tremendous oppression, there's an idol to Baal in the backyard. And the instruction given to Gideon is to go tear down your father's altar. Okay? And I want to tell you, some of us, some of our families, some of us in our personal lives, we have altars to Baal. If you have an altar to Baal, you should tear it down. When the apostles were speaking, when the apostles were speaking, there was a group of people in the city and they brought all of their books of magic. They brought all their pornography. They brought all their video games. They brought all their DVDs. They brought their Netflix account. They brought their TikTok account and they threw it into a pile and they lit it on fire. And that's what you should do if you want to serve Jesus. Make a clean cut. And you say, well, that's too much to give up. Jesus gave up heaven for you. He left heaven for you. He gave his own life for you. And these things that we hold on to, this is not the substance of this talk here today, but they're going to sink us because probation is closing and you are not going to be ready for Jesus' second coming if you are connected to this world. You know, the average American watches, I don't know, I think it's three hours of, of TV a day when you take into account Netflix and streaming and your phone and all that stuff. You know, they, the average uh, video gamer in America plays, uh, like, wastes three years of their life playing video games. You know, and probation is closing. Do you want to be ready for meeting Jesus? Be careful about where you spend your time. You know, some people, it would be better for them to take a hammer and hit their TV in the face. You know, that would be a good thing to do. Did you know that Anton Sounder LaVey, the founder of the Church of Satan, said that in every single household, there is an altar to Satan. It's called the television. You know, and now you have the television in your pocket. Right? You know, I don't know. There, we could preach a whole sermon on that and... Uh, You'd throw things at me maybe, but I mean, I think that the fact, it needs to be said. I mean, we're at the end of time. Don't waste time. Please, don't waste time on watching evil things. Throw them away. Get rid of them. If your eye offends you, pluck it out, you know? Um, anyways, Gideon is told to go to his father's backyard and to take the altar and cut it down. And he was afraid. Gideon is afraid. He's like, my dad's a very important man. He's got all these servants. How can I do this? And so he goes at night, he takes 10 men, and he does exactly what the Lord says, and he, he cuts down the altar of Baal and all the trees that are in the grove. And when the men of the city arose early in the morning, behold, the altar of Baal was cast down, and the grove was cut down that was by it. And they said, skipping down here to verse 29, they said, who did this? And somebody else said, that's Gideon who did that. And they said, bring out your son to Joash. They said, bring out your son, we're going to kill him. Because he cut down our television. Because he got rid of our pornography. Because he got rid of our video games. We want to kill your son. And Joash says, are you going to plead for Baal? Like, are you out of your mind? This is a devil, like in your backyard. In my backyard, it's in my house. He's like, my son did the right thing. If you want to plead for Baal, whoever wants to plead for Baal, let him be put to death. Okay, so then Gideon, he tears down the altar, and this altercation happens. But don't think that, you know, you're going to go out and serve Jesus with a foot in the devil's camp. It's not possible. If you want to emancipate people, you have to be emancipated yourself. 
It's just the reality of it. So that the Lord can work with you and give you power. The power comes from Jesus. But no man can serve two masters. Either he'll love the one and hate the other, or love the other one and hate the, the other one. You know, you cannot serve God and man, and Jesus says. Make a clean break. Say in your heart, Jesus, I will serve you with all of my heart. I wish that somebody had this, talk, had had this talk with me when I was your age, to be honest with you. I wasted tons of time. I escaped barely with my life. from the. I used to work at the video store. I'd bring home a stack of movies like this. I'd watch all of them. My mother would say, are you going to really watch that R-rated trash? Yep. Yeah, I am. You know, I watched all sorts of garbage. I don't even have a TV. I made a vow to stop watching movies. And some of you, if you want to go to heaven, you need to make the same vow and ask Jesus to help you keep it. Too much, too strong? It's the truth. So Gideon wants to go out and fight the Midians, Midianites, and he's got 32,000 men. Now, the army of Midian is a million people. They're like the grasshoppers, the Bible says. And so Gideon has two, two tests that God has given him. Because Gideon tested God twice with the fleece. And God says, okay, I see what you're doing. And so Gideon has two tests that he has to give to his army. So he goes to his army of 32,000 men. 32,000 against a million. So his army is already like teeny tiny. His army is already nothing. And Gideon says to his army, everybody who's afraid, go home. And then he held his breath. <gasps> and he watched. And he watched while thousands of men went home. The second test, God says, you still have too many men. And he takes them down to drink like a dog in the stream. And everybody who drinks like a dog is sent home. If you drink out of your hand, you get to go fight the Midianites. That was 300 people. So you have 300 people against a million people. Why does God do this? It's so that the glory of man is laid in the dust. So no human credit is going to be taken by humanity. Gideon goes against a million people with 300 men. His army is a joke. From statistical, from any empirical, from any scientific or generals or maneuvers or anything like that, they'd say, you are a fool for going to fight against this superior host. But God is not restricted. He is, his arm is not shortened. He can say by many or he can say by few. And many times he prefers to say by few. Now, Gideon is told, and really this is the point of this talk here, this short first part. Gideon is still afraid. And if you were Gideon and you had 300 men and you were going to go fight a million people, you'd be scared too. And so God comes to, to Gideon and he says, I have delivered this host into your hand. You see it up there, verse 9? I have delivered the host into your hand. Okay? This is the same thing that was said to Israel before they go into the promised land. God says to them, I've given you the promised land. And they said, no, we don't believe you. We don't trust you. God says to Gideon, I've given this army into your hand. They're yours. You're going you're gonna to destroy them. But, he says, if you are still afraid to go down, and I know you are, if you are afraid... God knows that Gideon is afraid. And he says, go down with your servant and listen to what you're going to hear. Then your hand will be strengthened. So Gideon and his servant, they wait till nightfall, and they sneak down into the camp of the enemy. Have you ever snuck around? You know, snuck around in the dark, and you're, you're trying not to be caught. You're trying not to be caught by security. You're sneaking around and you're, you know, you're dodging, you know, you're, you're crawling through the bushes. Gideon is crawling through the bushes on his hands and his knees in the dark, being really, really stealthy, really, really quiet. And he comes down to the edge of the camp of a million people. And they're spread out like grasshoppers. And they are sitting there in the dark underneath the stars. And he's listening to the conversation. The conversation goes like this. One guy who's a soldier in the Midianite army, he's like, I had a weird dream. The guy, the guy he's talking to says, tell me about it. And he says, in my dream, I saw a tent, one of the tents of Moab. 
It's one of the tents of Moab. I saw this tent. And, um, and a cake of barley bread tumbled into the host of Midian and came to the tent and smote it that it fell and overturned it. And the tent lay down flat along. And his fellow answered and said, this is nothing else save this, the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. For into his hand has God delivered Midian and all the host. Now, this is the point. God has given you victory in Christ. Your temptations that are so hard to overcome, you're fighting against them. You're thinking, I can't beat this temptation. I'm never going to beat this temptation. It's too hard. I don't even want to try. That temptation, actually, you have already been given victory over in the person of Christ because he overcame that temptation. So what enables Gideon to fight and to have the courage to fight is that he hears, he understands that he is already a winner. Let me say it again. God says to him, I've given you the host. You're going to beat them. The host is there. Gideon goes down and he hears them talking. And they say, it's over. The, the battle is over. It hasn't even started. Gideon's army is going to come down the hill like a piece of bread. There's a bagel came rolling down the hill and it hit the tent and the tent fell over. And the other guy's like, yeah, that's Gideon. It's over, man. It's over. We're all going to be destroyed. And Gideon says, okay, I hear you. I hear you. And up until that point, Gideon had been too afraid to fight. But when he heard that, when he heard that he was going to win from the mouth of the very people that he was going to fight, he was like, okay, I hear you. I hear the voice of God. And he goes up to his men, his 300 men, and he shakes them awake and he says, wake up because God has given the Midianites into our hands. And really, this is the secret to Christian overcoming. Christian overcoming is that you are already a conqueror in Jesus Christ. His victory is your victory by faith. When you show up to the battle, it is a foregone conclusion in Christ that you will win as long as you put your faith in Christ. Because he is already a conqueror. If you are in him by faith, you are also already a conqueror. So Gideon has courage to fight because he hears from the people he's going to fight themselves that he is going to win. And that's what I'm here to tell you tonight as well. The Christian walk begins with the victory that Christ has won for you already. By faith, that victory becomes your victory. And you are more than conquerors in Christ. Let's look at, um, let's look at Romans chapter 8. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Who is he that condemns? It is Christ that died, yes, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God. And then you have this long list of things. Verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of God? Paul is asking rhetorically. He's saying there is nothing that can separate you from the love of God because the love of God is in Christ. And humanity and divinity has been knit back together. So look at this list. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. As it is written, for your sake, all day long we are killed. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. No, in, these, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. So where is the conquering? It is in Christ. You are a conqueror in Christ. So look at the list. Tribulation. Did Jesus suffer tribulation? Certainly. Did he suffer distress? Think about Gethsemane. Where he's sweating great drops of blood. Yes, he suffered distress. Persecution. Yes, famine. A fast of almost six weeks. Nakedness, peril, sword. He suffered it all. 
for you. Not just for you, but as the representative of humanity. And Paul says, in all of these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And then he says this, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So where is the love of God? It's in Jesus. Who is Jesus? He is the re-knitting of humanity and divinity back together again in a way that can never be separated. Those bonds are never going to be broken. Nothing can separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. It's impossible. And you are more than a conqueror in Christ. And so this is the secret to Christian overcoming. The things that, you know, you struggle with, Jesus has struggled with those temptations, and he has won. Now, I'm going to segue. So that I wanted to talk, you know, a little bit about a certain number of things. The first one is Christian overcoming. Now, I promised that uh, I would also talk about current events. How many of you have heard of climate change? Is that a big issue in your life? You hear about that a lot? Okay, I saw a lot more things, uh, a lot more hands for climate change than I did for Fox's Book of Martyrs. Okay, everybody is talking about climate change. Are they not? It's one of the major issues of the day. Now, I cut down this portion of the presentation from like 90 slides to about 14. But in the interests of time, if you want to see the whole presentation, it's online. But the bottom line is, is that your demographic, the kids who are coming up between 18 and 24, 59% of kids your age or close to your age group say that this is a major issue. And they are terrified of the future. This is 59% of kids. And they want to do something about it. I think it's, uh, it's, over, it's over, I think it's 53% of people in France between 18 and 24 if they had the power to do it, they would limit you for your entire lifetime to four flights. You would never be allowed to fly more than four times in France, okay? Because they have been told, they have been bombarded with propaganda that this, the planet is going to spontaneously combust if we don't stop flying and if we don't stop driving. Now, some people say that this is not related to end time events. I want to look at what the Bible says on the subject of climate change. So this is Genesis 11:5. Just in the interest of time, this is speaking of the Tower of Babel. God is saying, uh, through Moses, who wrote the book of Genesis, he's saying this is what happened with the Tower of Babel. There was a group of people, they were told to disperse through the whole earth. Instead of dispersing, they all got together. They said, let's build a city and a tower. And they called that city and tower Babylon. And they said, behold, the people is one. They have all one language, and this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. So God comes down, and he looks and sees what they're doing. They're building this tower. Not only are they building a tower, but according to the Bible and to historians, they're doing something else. What is it? So Nimrod is the one who excited them to build the Tower of Babel. Is the grandson of Ham, the son of Noah. He persuaded them not to ascribe to, ascribe to God, as it were, through his means that they were happy. He said, he also, he also gradually changed the government into tyranny, seeing no other way of turning men from their fear of God, but to bring them into a constant dependence upon his power. So this is Josephus, the famous Jewish historian. There's a citation if you want to look it up. He also said that he would be revenged, this being Nimrod, if he should have a mind to drown the world again, for that he would build a tower too high for the waters to be able to reach, and that he would avenge himself on God for destroying their forefathers. So Nimrod, his name means rebellion. God had told them to disperse. He says, no, we're not dispersing. He says, I'm going to build a city. We're going to build a city, and his name means rebellion. And he was a tyrant because he wants to have one world government. He was a rebel. He was a builder of cities, but he was something else. He was a climate agitator because he told the people of that time period, if you don't build this tower, there's a chance that God is going to destroy this earth again with another flood. We have got to prevent against climate change, a rapid climate change. Did the climate change? 
in the, in, uh, the book of Genesis? Yeah, it changed a whole lot. It was called the flood, right? And carbon dioxide did not cause the flood. You know what did? Sin. That's what causes climate change in the scriptures. And there are incidents over and over and over in the Bible. Did the weather change in the time of Elijah? Yes, there was a drought for three years, three and a half years. Did the weather change in the time of Noah? Absolutely. There are incident after incident after incident. I took the slides out with all of the examples. This is Patriarchs and Prophets. One object before them in the erection of the tower was to secure their own safety in the case of another deluge. That means one of the purposes in the building of Tower of Babel was to protect themselves against climate change. Just let that sink in. Okay? You have the nations of the earth and the religions of the earth getting together right now. You just had COP28. You guys hear about COP28? How many of you heard? Okay, COP28 was a big gathering. It was the first time all the religions of the world were there. Most of the religions of the world. There was a huge long list. They had a pavilion set up. One of the Pope, uh, the Pope gave a, uh, he couldn't make it there in person, but he gave his cardinal uh, a speech. And you know what he said? Climate change is a religious issue. And all the religions of the world in ecumenical gathering are asking the governments of the world to do something about it. What does the Pope want to be done? He wants the Sunday to be sacred as a means of preserving the climate. All you have to do is read his encyclical and you see that. 2015, Laudato Si. You know, I think that this should be one of the things that you study in your classes. The Pope's encyclical, 2015, so that you know exactly what is going on. Too many people are in the dark about these things. One purpose of the Tower of Babel was to build as a contingent against climate change. According to historians, they built for 43 to 45 years. So it was a long endeavor. And finally, they built this massive structure. It's huge. And Nimrod told them, listen, this place is going to be this place is going to be very important. And um, he told them that they were going to found a monarchy that should eventually embrace the whole earth. So don't miss that. Nimrod is saying one of the things that we are doing here is we are building one world government. Do we see one world government being built today? Yes, we do. Okay, and how are they doing it? They're doing it with climate fear mongering. You know? The World Health Organization is being encouraged by certain governmental bodies to add climate change to the list of things that constitute a pandemic, which would give the World Health Organization power to take control over a pandemic response around the world. What does Revelation chapter 13 say? The second beast says to those who dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast. It's very interesting. The interesting thing about building a climate change tower of Babel is that God had specifically said in verse 11 there, you see in Genesis 9, I will establish my covenant with you, neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood, neither shall there be any more a flood to destroy the earth. So God makes a promise to everybody. He says there's not going to be another flood that destroys the whole earth. That's never going to happen. Nimrod says, we don't trust God. We're going to build. We're going to build this city, and we're going to build this tower, and it's going to be the seat of universal empire, and we are going to protect ourselves against the judgments of the God of heaven. Okay? Now, that is what is happening today. They are building Babylon, and one of the things they are using to build it is climate change. We'll come to that in a moment. Now, what kind of people does Jesus say are going to be alive at the end of the world? Matthew 13, Jesus says that at the end of the world... He tells this parable. Kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. So he's talking about a farmer. The farmer comes and he prepares the soil and he takes his bag of seeds and he seeds the field, right? He's sowing good crops. But at night, they learn a little while later after the blade has sprung up that an enemy came and sowed wicked, bad seed in the field. I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, but he's sowing bad seed in the field. And so his servants come to him and say, sir, didn't you sow good seed? And he says, yes, I did. I sowed good seed. And he says, an enemy has done this. And the servants say, do you want us to gather them up? And he says, no, lest while you gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. 
So he's saying when it's young, when the plants are young, you can't tell. When can you tell? When can you tell what is, have you guys gardened before? When can you tell whether it's a wheat or a weed, whether it's corn or carrots or peas or potatoes or whatever, when can you tell? When it's high, right? When it's mature. And so the Lord says, the Lord of this farmer, he says, wait until everything is grown high. Then you're going to be able to tell what's good and what's bad. Because if you try and pull it up right now, you're going to pull up some of the good stuff. And that's talking also about your spiritual growth, your Christian growth. Some of you in here are baby Christians. You know, and people might say, well, you're not doing this and this and this, but you are a baby Christian and you are following Jesus. And you're learning to follow Jesus right now, right? Keep going. Because you're going to grow. And as you grow, as the seed that was planted in your heart, that you have been ransomed, that your debt has been paid, that Jesus loves you, as that seed grows in your heart, you're going to grow up into him. You're going to change. You're going to change. You're going to, be, you're going to become a different person. But what does Jesus say here? The disciples come to Jesus and they say, they say, we don't understand this parable. Can you explain it to us? And so Jesus says, here's the explanation. The person who sows the good seed is the son of man. So that's Christ. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world and the reapers are the angels. So he lays it all out for them. This is, this is what it means. Now, Jesus continues. He says, As therefore the weeds are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of the world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Okay, so what happens to the weeds at the end? They get gathered up by the angels, and what happens? They get chucked into the fire. Okay, but all of those who the seed grows in their heart, what is the seed? That you have been ransomed. That Jesus loves you. It is the goodness of God that leads to repentance. And you ask Jesus to create in you a clean heart and a new heart, make you a new person, and you will grow as a Christian. But at the end of time, the people who grow up, you just imagine this, none of you are farmers, maybe it's hard to, to have context, but you just imagine you're a farmer and you're going through your fields, okay? And you're anticipating the harvest. You know, you go to the Midwest and the corn is like, you know, eight feet tall. It's huge. You can't miss what it is. It's corn. You know? But there's another seed that was planted that grows up into maturity. And that is the seed of the wicked one. So just like God's seed, when he plants it, it grows up into maturity. Satan's seed grows up into maturity too. So if the people who the gospel is planted in, they grow up into the likeness of Christ, who are the people, who are the weeds, who do they look like? Anybody? Who do they look like? They look like Satan. Right? When the good seed gets planted in the heart, the seed grows up into the likeness of Christ. But when the bad seed gets planted in the heart, it, you know, the natural heart, that's the seed that's already there, it grows up into the likeness of Satan. Well, who is Satan? Satan was a murderer from the beginning. So what are the people on this planet going to look like at the end? They're going to be murderers. Do you see how that's the way it works? The people on this earth at the end are going to be murderers. And they're going to be liars. And they're going to be thieves. They don't believe in right or wrong. They don't believe in the golden rule. They don't believe in accountability. Now, we talked a little bit about evolution, but evolution is a doctrine that always leads to murder. Did you know that? Fully developed, it leads to murder. Why? Because in the natural selection model, there's no impediment, there's no, there's no restriction to murder. Because there's no God and there's no right or wrong. Right? When you're competing for scarce resources, it's the strong who survive in the evolutionary model. There's no place for the golden rule in evolution. What does the golden rule say? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Evolution says that's weakness. Might makes right. There are no rights from God because there is no God. There is no accountability. This is the theory of evolution. Now, I know that's a little bit maybe hard to read. The title of Darwin's book, which he began writing in 1844, 
was on the origins of the species by means of natural selection. You've heard of this book, right? Yes? Okay, very famous book, right? The full title is, Or the Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. So Darwin advocated eugenics. Darwin advocated murder. It is the strong who survive. If you don't like racism, you should hate evolution, evolutionism. Because evolution is racism. It is Marxism. That's Darwin. Now, you don't believe me, maybe. I want you to listen to what this man has to say. Do we have the volume up? It's the second highest the priority. The second biggest thing is, is global climate change. Okay. We've got to... Uh, and, 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 and for so many reasons, we've got to move off of fossil fuel. Not, Not doing it will, will be catastrophic. catastrophic. We'll, we'll have eight, eight degrees, degrees, we'll be eight degrees hotter in, in 10, 10, not 10, 10 but in 30 or 40 years, and basically, and basically none, none of the crops, crops will grow, most, most of the people will die, and the rest of us will be cannibals, civilization will have broken down, down. What the few, few people who are left will be living in a, in, in a failed state like Somalia or Sudan. And, and, and living conditions will be intolerable. The droughts will be so bad, there'll be no more corn growing. It, it will, it, but not doing it is suicide. And then after that, we've got to, we've got to stabilize the population. When I was born, there so what's wrong with the population? I mean, with too many people. That's, what, that's why we have global warming. We have global warming because too many people are using too much stuff. If there were less people, they'd be using less stuff. All right, so that's the founder of CNN, Ted Turner. Does Ted Turner want the population to go up or down? Okay. Now, what proportion of people in this room do you think Ted Turner would eliminate if he had a choice in the subject? There's 8 billion people on the planet. According to Ted Turner, we need to go back down to 250 to 300 million people. How do you get rid of that many people? There's a word for it in the Bible. It's murder. <clears throat> How do you get rid of this many people? This is the UN Secretary General, July 27, 2023. Climate change is here. It's terrifying, and it is just the beginning. The era of global warming has ended. The era of global boiling has arrived. The air is unbreathable. The heat is unbearable. Yada, yada, yada. No more hesitancy, no more excuses, no more waiting for others to move first. There is simply no more time for that. So the people who run the earth, the elites, are saying, we're out of time. We have to do something about this now. What do they want to do something about? The population. Now, in Genesis 8.21, the Lord smells a sweet savor. And the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. So the Lord cursed the ground at the fall, and when Cain murdered Abel, and again at the flood. He says, I'm never doing that again. Genesis 8.22, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. That is a promise to you, that this earth continues to support life until the end of the world. You don't have to worry that the planet is going to combust, Okay. According to the Bible, this is the promise in God's word, the solemn truth of God's word. This planet continues to support life until Christ returns. Okay? You could take that to the bank. So if you are having trouble sleeping at night because of climate change, you can stop. Okay? Oh, it's a spoiler alert. That's not what's going to happen. Okay, there's going to be plenty of problems on this earth, wars and rumors of war. The plagues are going to fall. It's going to get really hot. But there is also going to be summer and winter, cold and heat, seed time and harvest until the end. So Jesus has not abandoned this planet. He's not an absentee landlord who's just forgotten about us down here. He knows exactly what time it is. And he's coming back. Now, you have two narratives. You have the UN's narrative and you have the papacy's narrative. Something must be done right now. We are at the point of, we are at the point of no return. The planet is about to combust. And then you have the Bible saying, listen, take it easy. 
Jesus is coming back and the planet is going to sustain life? Do you think that Jesus is going to lead us all out on this journey as Christians so that we can combust? You know, so that there's going to be no food? If you are the follower of Jesus Christ, Jesus says your bread and water will be sure. You might not have Burger King to eat, but you'll have bread and water. And that might be more than other people have. Okay? So let's just remember that Jesus loves us and he has his eye on the sparrow. He has his eye on this planet. He is coming back. Okay? He has promised and he is good to his word. Now, I want you to hear what this man says. This is Yuval Noah Harari. He is the principal advisor to Klaus Schwab at the World Economic Forum. You should be keeping an eye on organizations like the World Economic Forum so that you see what is going on regarding this subject and, you know, the push for global government and digital currencies and control over the internet. All of these things are happening right now. We're going to talk a little bit more about that, but I want you to hear what he says specifically about human rights. Now, you may find it acceptable that, yes, in the religious field, humans cooperate by believing in the same fictions. Millions of people come together to build a cathedral or a mosque or fight on a crusade or in a jihad because they all believe in the same stories about God and heaven and hell. But what I want to emphasize is that exactly the same mechanism underlies all other forms of mass-scale human cooperation, not only in the religious field. Take, for example, the legal field. Most legal systems today in the world are based on a belief in human rights. But what are human rights? Human rights, just like God and heaven, are just a story that we've invented. They are not an objective reality. They are not some biological fact about homo sapiens. Take a human being, cut him open, look inside, you will find the heart, the kidneys, neurons, hormones, DNA, but you won't find any rights. The only place you find rights is in the stories that we have invented and spread around over the last few centuries. They may be very positive stories, very good stories, but they are still just fictional stories that we've invented. Okay, so notice what he's saying there from the evolutionary perspective. And this is the principal advisor to the World Economic Forum. His books are endorsed by Bill Clinton and Bill Gates and Barack Obama and all of these people, okay? He's a very popular person with the globalists, okay? He says your rights are a fiction that we've invented. The only place you find human rights is in the stories. That's the only place you find them. And he's talking about the Bible. Okay? If you believe in creation, you should wear that as a badge proudly as a Christian. Because it's patriotic. Because your rights, according to the Declaration of Independence, come from God. And according to this man, there's no such thing as human rights. You are a polluter and a consumer and an emitter. You are threatening the survival of the planet. I took all of these slides out tonight. If you want to see the whole presentation, you can watch it online. But, you know, big people names, David Attenborough and Prince Philip and all these people talking about the need to kill a lot of people on this planet. World Economic Forum member calls for 86% reduction in world's population. This is Dennis Meadows. So he says that he wants to dramatically reduce the population. He says that he hopes that the goal can be achieved peacefully. He's one of the principal authors of the Club of Rome's 1972 pro-depopulation book, The Limits to Growth. And he's a member of the, of the uh, World Economic Forum and the Club of Rome. So he says that genocide of 86% of the world's population is inevitable. But he says a benevolent dictatorship could accomplish the mass depopulation peacefully. Okay, so that's one of the things that's going on in our world today. This is a call from people who are murderers. They don't believe in God. They don't believe in human rights for the elimination of the vast majority of the people on this planet. Now, if you know Revelation chapter 14, 
It says, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who created the heavens and the earth, the seas and the fountains of waters. And that angel has the gospel to give to every person on this earth. So the elites, the people who run the planet say, you are an emitter and a polluter. We need to eliminate you. You have no human rights. You are a plague on this earth. But the gospel says Jesus bought you. He bought you. You are precious to him, and he's coming back for you. Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. It's judgment time. And murderers are going to get their due. So that is part of the last message that needs to go to this earth. That people know that Jesus loves them. Because the elites say, you're a polluter. In fact, I saw a study that says that you are, you are, your, your carbon monoxide is not negligent regarding climate change. One of the things we have to do is get rid of you. Um, Amazon One, how many of you have heard of Amazon One? Okay, this is biometric palm scanning. Okay, so you go into the, the Whole Foods store and they've got this machine there. Have you guys seen this? You guys haven't seen this? Okay, one or two people. Okay, I was in Whole Foods the other day, they got these machines there, how does it work? You put your hand over the scanner. Okay, it's connected to your bank account. And all of a sudden it goes bloop, and you pay for your groceries without pulling out a credit card, it's just your hand. Okay, so this kind of thing is being ro rolled out in the Whole Foods across America and in other stores as well. I don't know what the final thing is going to look like. Maybe there's multiple final things, but what does the mark say? You receive a mark in your hand or in your forehead, right? You receive a mark in your hand or in your forehead. And that mark is the mark of the beast, of, first, of the first beast of Revelation chapter 13. So it's, this is connected to buying and selling. So this is where we are in Earth's history. Here's the World Economic Forum, Klaus Schwab, saying that global governments must harness AI to become masters of the world. So one of the things that they want to do is use artificial intelligence to monitor buying and selling with a digital currency. I mean, this is not, I don't think I'm telling you anything new. You guys know this, right? That this is what's going on. You don't know this? I'm seeing people shake their heads. You, you guys don't know this? No, I mean, this is what's going on. UN demands global guidelines on internet speech to silence insects thriving in the dark. You know, they want to control the internet. Countries around the world. Did you know Rumble is banned in France and Brazil? You know what Rumble is, right? It's kind of the alternative to YouTube. It's banned because they can't control it, so they've cut it off. Okay, so there are controls of speech. Now, in the last... 10 minutes here. Let's open up our Bibles to Revelation chapter 13. Okay, I mean, this is, this is you know, really just we're, we're, touching, we're touching the issue. We're barely skirting it. Um, uh, but Revelation 13 verse 14. Let's start there. <clears throat> speaking of the seven, second beast that it deceives them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by the sword and did live so who is this first beast in Revelation chapter 13 I, I am assuming that you guys know all of this what's that papal Rome, papal Rome. okay so papal Rome is that first beast of Revelation chapter 13. And you know how it comes up out of the water and it has the names of blasphemy and it continues for 1260 years and it receives a deadly wound and the deadly wound is healed, right? Okay. Now, one of the interesting things about this is that, you know, when we look at this, historically speaking, we've said, well, the first beast of Revelation chapter 13 is a church state power and then the second beast is going to make a church state power and it is going to control the conscience, right? And of course that that's true. But we always talk about the religious element. We always talk about the religious element regarding the second beast and the making of the image to the beast, all right? But what does it mean to make an image to the first beast? You have to study the first beast. It's a church state power, right? 
We always talk about the church side of the equation. We don't talk about the civil side of the equation. Do you understand what I mean by that? Or, or am, I, am I talking too fast here? Okay, I'm okay? Okay. So there's, there's a civil side to the equation. What, what does this church state power on the civil side, what does it do? Okay. Does it control people's speech? Historically speaking? Yes, it does. Okay, so the, tr the first beast controls people's speech and the ideas that can be expressed. So that's not just a, a control over what you can say, it's a control over what other people can hear. You're controlling the dialogue. You're preventing the functioning of the marketplace of ideas. This is what the first beast did, historically. This is a screenshot from the old cover. If you can read the top there, it says, Index Librorum Prohibitorum. How many of you are familiar with this? This is the, the list of banned books maintained by the papacy. They had hundreds and hundreds of books that were banned that you could not possess. If you were found in possession of these books, they would kill you. If you were caught with these books, they would burn the books and burn you sometimes. Okay? What was on this list? John Milton, Paradise Lost, Alexander Dumas, who wrote The Three Musketeers, and The Count of Monte Cristo. That's fiction. But it was talking about escaping the power of the state and defying the power of the state and the church. And so it ended up on this book. John Locke, David Hume, these are the kinds of books. Alexis de Tocqueville, they were, these are the books that ended up on this list. It was illegal for you to have them. They censored it. So what does the second beast do when it makes an image to the beast? It censors you. Is there censorship going on today? You guys watch what happened during the course of the last four years? Regardless of what side of the issue you're on. Okay, YouTube, if you tried to say something, you took it down. You know who told the YouTube to take it down? The government. You can go and look up all of this stuff. You can look at the, the, the Twitter files, what's called the Twitter files, Matt Tabibi. How many of you have heard of this? Oh, mercy, you guys. Okay, go look this up. <clears throat> it was abundantly proven through the emails that the government is colluding with Twitter and YouTube to take down content that it didn't like during COVID. And not just content that it didn't like during COVID, but the papacy has repeatedly called recently for controls of so-called misinformation. So what is one of the way markers about where we are in the stream of time regarding the image to the beast? It's censorship. The Bill of Rights says you have freedom of speech. What is happening to the second beast? It is censoring. It is speaking like a dragon. It is changing into a dragon right now. That means that we are closer down the timeline than we realize. Because these things are happening right now. Right now, you have a call for one world government. Right now, you have a call for there to be action by all the governments of the world on climate change at the request and demand of the churches. This is something that's taking place right now. A friend of mine grew up in Nebraska. <clears throat> now this is gonna be a little controversial, but I'm gonna say it anyways. A friend of mine grew up in Nebraska a little while ago, you know, 40 years ago. And when he was, that's a little while to me. Uh, when he was growing up, his church school taught him that the deadly wound was healed. Kenneth Cox, who used to preach on 3ABN, used to say the deadly wound is healed. But now we hear that the deadly wound is going to be healed some point in the future. You know, meanwhile, there is one, arguably one person on the planet who has more control and authority over any of the others. And that is Pope Francis. If you want to find more ambassadors today in one place, where would you go? You'd go to Vatican City. Diplomatic relations with 183 countries more than the United States of America, okay? So is the world wondering after the beast? You better believe it. So what days are we living in? I have just touched on this subject just very briefly, 
okay? I could go, we could go on and on and on, but it is time to wrap up here and, uh, and conclude the talk for this evening. But suffice to say, listen, listen to me, okay? If you have to take this and shut this off and give it to somebody else so that you aren't, you know, doing whatever it is you're on, you're, you're on it, you need to be aware of what's happening in these days. Because we are supposed to be watchmen on the walls to raise the sound of the trumpet about what days we are living in. And you can't raise the trumpet alarm if you don't know what days you are living in. There are many things that show that Jesus is coming back very soon. Are there wars and rumors of wars? Yes. Are there earthquakes and famines and floods? Yes. The signs are stacking up. Are there disasters by rail and by sea in the great shipping lanes, as we are told in the spirit of prophecy? What happened just last week? What came down? Can I have five more minutes? In five minutes, I want to tell you, I want to just tell you, I just want to, I want to, you know, we talk about the close of probation. The close of probation is the idea that God's mercy pleads for a certain period of time, but that there is a, a time when the door closes. That's it. Right? And if you start to look at this doctrine in the scriptures, you know, a lot of people, I have a Baptist friend, she says that's not a biblical doctrine. Listen to this. In the book of Noah, I'm mean, sorry, in the story of Noah, in the story, in the book of Genesis, in the story of Noah, God comes to Noah and he says, you alone have I found worthy. What does that mean? That God has investigated Noah, right? If I have found you worthy, that means I have scrutinized you, I have investigated you. So the task is given to Noah to build the ark. Then what happens? The animals come after the preaching for 120 years. The animals come two by two, seven by seven. They go up the plank into the boat and everybody has a last chance, right? And then what happens? The door closes, right? The angel closes the door and that's it. If you're inside the ark, you're inside. If you're outside the ark, you're outside. I'm not doing my job if I don't tell you this, okay? It is almost over. If you are not in the ark, get in the ark. Do not wait. Satan wants to take your crown, and he's using this and a hundred other things to try and delay your preparation in this book and your, and your faith in Christ and your awareness of where you are. When that door shuts, that's it. Another story, Sodom and Gomorrah. God says to Abraham, I'm going to destroy that city. Abraham pleads with God. He's making intercession. Abraham is in the door of his tent, making intercession with God. He's saying, please spare the city if there is 50. God says, I'll spare it for 50. 45, God. Yes, I'll spare it for 40. 45. 40, 30, 20, 10. Yes, yes, yes. Then the angels are sent down into Sodom. Who are they investigating? They're investigating the righteous. God has already concluded that Sodom is wicked beyond wicked. That's not what he's going down there to look at. He's going down there to look at those who take the name of God. Okay? You know, in some chapters, in, some, in certain chapters before, the, the record of the scriptures is that Sodom was exceedingly sinful. God already knows that. Who is he scrutinizing? He's investigating Lot. The angels present themselves to Lot. What does Lot do? The angels tell Lot, this city is going to be destroyed. And um, actually, I'm getting ahead of myself. The men of Sodom come to the door of Lot's house because they've seen the angels go into Lot's house, right? You know this story? Okay. They come to Lot's house, the men of the city, and they bang on the door, and they say, those men who came into your house, bring them out. We want to have sex with them. And Lot says to them, you guys don't do this. You're wicked. So Lot goes outside of the door, and he preaches a message in the city. And the men of Sodom say, who are you to judge us? Notice what's happening. You're judging us by warning us. 
and the angels pull Lot back inside, and the door is shut. Isn't it interesting that there's another story about a door? You've got the door in the ark, and it shuts. You've got the door with Lot, and it shuts. Then what happens? Then Lot flees, and fire and brimstone rains on that city, and it's over. And I'm here to tell you, friends, it's almost over. The door will close. The door will close. And the question is, is are you on the inside or the outside? But that's not just the only question. Who is going to warn this world? Your family, your friends. You know, the probation is going to close. The disasters that we see around us shows that the coming of Christ is near. I know evangelists who say Jesus' coming is 500 years off. You know? Those guys are off in left field. He's coming soon. Soon, even at the door. All of the disasters and the things that are happening on this earth show it. Another example of this. Why does it happen over and over and over? The two spies come into the land of Canaan, right? Joshua is about to go into the land of Canaan. Jesus is Joshua. Joshua means Jesus. So they come back to the border of the promised land. And Joshua is leading them, and he sends two spies, right? What's another word for spy? Investigate. He sends two men to investigate Jericho. They go into the city, and they, they meet up with Rahab, and they tell her, this city's going to be destroyed. And she says, I know, save me and my household. So there's a, an investigation, there's a warning that's given, And they tell Rahab, everybody in your house, put the scarlet thread in the window. That's the blood of Christ, right? Take the blood of Christ, hide in the house, the Passover. The angel of death is coming to Jericho, they tell her. Everybody inside the house is safe. If you're outside the house, their blood is on their head. And then the door shuts. Isn't that interesting? Over and over and over. There are other examples in Scripture. Daniel is investigated. There is a warning. The door shuts. The stone is rolled against the the cave with the lions. The seal is placed on the cave with the lions. The seal, right? Daniel, even though he's with the lions, during that time of trouble, there's a seal of the emperor on that den. Right? That's what happens to God's people. They're in the time of trouble, but they have been sealed. When the stone is rolled away, they come out. Right? This happens over and over and over in Scripture as a warning that Jesus is coming soon. You want to be in the ark. Don't wait. You have been ransomed. Jesus loves you. He has bought you. Don't wait to be in the ark. That's my five minutes. Okay. Let's stand to our feet. We'll have closing prayer here. And um, thank you so much. I know it's been a long day, long night last night, and you're sleepy, and, and uh, you know, there's a lot to listen to up here. Um, so thank you, for, thank you for your time. And um, my, my exhortation to you is that you be in this book like never before. This is your compass. Be in this book. I don't want to keep you standing, but I, you know, somebody asked me, well, how do you come close to Christ? Go sit outside. Go talk to the Lord. Go pray. Go sit on the park bench or under a tree. Go talk to God. Tell him what's on your heart. Don't wait. Don't wait. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, Lord, I just pray for these young people. I pray for, I pray for their, their spiritual walk, Lord. Lord, that they would see that you love them. And if there are people who have not made a decision for you in this place, I pray that they will not wait. I pray that they will not wait. Lord, help us to watch what is going on and be watchmen on the walls and warn others faithfully. Lord, we pray that we will be ready when you come. Please forgive us for our sins and cleanse us from unrighteousness. And praise the Lord, today the door of mercy is open. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much. Happy Sabbath. You may be seated. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Brother Jay.
Um, I just want to make a quick announcement, and then we're going to have a one student come up and actually pray for you, Brother Jay. Um, so uh, you can just come over here real quick. But if you if your name is on the list, um, there's about 40 of you. Uh, I'll be in the cafeteria about 5.45 to 5.50. I'll have some supplies for you. And uh, make sure you dress warm. Make sure that you have my phone number to make sure when we're out and uh, sharing the, the good news that, yeah, if there's anything that comes up that you have my number. So thank you so much, Brother Jay. Uh, you know, you've came come a, a while to be here, uh, a ways to be here, and we just thank you so much for how God has led uh, this last weekend. I'm going to invite up Louie here. He's going to say a prayer for you here uh, as you go. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you very much for sending Jay over here. Uh, Lord, Satan is not happy because when truth is being told, more people are impacted and, and they really want to grow. But Lord, we should not be afraid because your love casts out fear. We should not be afraid. We should be of good cheer because you have already overcome the world, Lord. This is nothing to us. When we die, there is no sting. Lord, please continue to be with Jay, direct his paths, and that his ministry can spread forth, Lord, that his light can light up other people. Continue to bless him, Lord, and fill us with the Holy Spirit and fill him with the Holy Spirit so that we can keep on moving forward and not be afraid, Lord. Give us courage. Bless him, bless his ministry, and guide us through the steps that we are going. Close doors that you don't want us to go through and open doors that you want us to go through and help us to be faithful, Lord. Again, give us courage, forgive us of our sins, and guide us, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Happy Sabbath. You may quietly dismiss to the cafeteria.